Hello and welcome to a new Friends of Tracking edition. It's been a while since we did anything and that from my side that's a lot because I've been busy teaching this course. We did a lot from the course but then after the course these guys started working away on their projects and I thought what I'd do is I'll just start by showing the project that um, they were asked to do. It's here, I've just got to go to final project. So what I did is I, I set up the final project for the, the mathematical modeling course as people running a, um, a, a football team. So what would you do if you were a data scientist running a football team? And each of the groups, there was about, there was about 60 students on the course. So they were in sort of groups 12 and 15 and each of them got one team. Um, and tonight we're going to hear from the Inter Milan team. But we also had a Real Madrid team, a Dortmund team and a Liverpool team. And also we had the, the there was a Slack group who did a um, Paris Saint-Germain team too. Um, and it, as part of each of the team, the idea was that they had to do a data scientist report on club performance, player performance and player fitness. So the club was all about looking at where the team was in the league. Did they need to strengthen their attack and defense? What areas did they need to improve, improve in? The player performance was all about identifying individuals. And I made sure that people should, that should go backwards and forwards. So if the club identified some risk factor in, in the attack, then the player performance and the recruitment strategy should re reflect that. And also the player fitness then should relate um, to that. We had an excellent lecture by Suds who told us all about acceleration and deceleration profiles. So that was the basis which we were going to use tracking data to look at player fitness. And so each of the groups did this and um, Inter Milan, I have to say, did particularly well. Just as you're going to see, just incredibly striking graphics, very nice conclusions, really in-depth knowledge of Italian football uh, certain people seem to have in the group, or they managed to get that in-depth knowledge within a short space of time and I, it was a real pleasure listening to them so it's really nice to have them on and I think without any further ado I'm going to we're going to we're going to go in the order that they're presented there um, I'm going to go over first to Lordve who's going to do the player report so I'll leave over to you Lordve. Thanks David it's actually the club report. <clears throat> oh sorry sorry yes I know that yeah um, thanks. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank my co authors, uh, Chaglar, Kaidan, and uh, Mingyan for all the hard work and project and uh, for letting me represent the group. Uh, and then, I just before we start, just a couple of disclaimers. Um, this is just a brief overview of the work we did. So, if you're interested in more details, just please reach out to me personally, and I'll sort you out. Uh, and the second one is that while I'm from a part from Norway that's famous for his mustache, as mine is purely seasonal. Uh, so if you'd like to support the Movember Foundation and help cancer research and put a focus on mental health, please feel free to use this link. Uh, but with that, let's start. So this is the club performance review for the 2017-18 uh, season for Inter Milan. Um, this was a season where Inter Milan, for the first time in six years, qualified for the Champions League. So does that mean that we're all good and set for a successful 18-19? Well, maybe not. Qualification came at the last minute and by the closest of margins as uh, we beat Lazio away in the final round and qualified on head-to-head -head results in spite of an inferior goal difference. So in order to ensure that we qualify again, we first need to ensure, understand what happened in 17-18 and why by looking at the underlying metrics and just the end result. So we'll do this using a couple of metrics. Of course, we're going to use expected goals, which is by now a well-known metric for assessing performance. It is, however, not sufficient to explain an entire season as it's a purely outcome-based metric and it doesn't take underlying pitch dominance into account. And it's also important to remember that assists and shots only represent about 1% of all the on-ball actions in football. So in order to alleviate that, we're also going to use Karun Singh's uh, expected threat metrics. Uh, expected threat is more uh, purely location-based, limited game state model. 
So it captures non-shot related game domination that will be ignored by the outcome based models. And uh, also we like the XT values because they're easy to interpret and they're not easily skewed by outliers. So it gives us uh, more robust play ratings. We also use this um, to, to rate players, especially defensively, which Christian is probably going to talk more about, but uh, it, it's a good way to, to rate defenses defensively if you do it right. So our approach here was to use a combination of these two models. We're using a weighted average of both these models in our performance evaluation. So we're taking both shot and pitch dominance into account, uh, and we're calling this the XGNT model. The weight we use are, they are derived from both possession ratios and shot ratios. So thus we're emphasizing XG more in shot heavy games and we're emphasizing XT more in possession heavy games where for some reasons team are unable to get shots and targets, etc. So based on this model, uh, we simulated the previous season in order to assess if the final league position was in line with the underlying performance and also to see if, you know, if the model makes sense. It's an eye test and it's fairly, you know, it seems to represent what actually happened fairly well. We do see that there's a bit of a toss up around fourth, possibly an overperformance from Roma, but um, fourth play for international was definitely not a closed case. Uh, again, the model seems to make sense. So we continue with it and uh, we're going to now have a look at some more detailed information we could gather from it. Um, starting with this cross plot. So this is a cross plot of um, XGNT for and against for the entire league with the intergames here highlighted. This yellow line that indicates that the XGNT uh, is evenly distributed. So you know, chances created are the same for both teams, indicating a draw. This red line here means that uh, Inter's opposition created a whole XGMT more than Inter. So this is, in this region, you're very likely to lose games. Vice versa here in this region and coming off here, that's when Inter created one XGMT more than the opposition and hence you expect to win these games. And of course, there's a sliding scales in between or is a little bit of both. Uh, but looking at this, there's a couple of uh, performances that stick out. Uh, more specifically, there seems to be something about Sassuolo because we both we lost both games against Sassuolo despite dominating heavily in both these games. So we should look into this to see if there's something underlying that we could prevent or if this is just black swan events. We also see a few draws here that could be turned into wins if you are more clinical and there's a few you know, couple of losses that could be turned into draws. Um, also, if you look at the same metrics along the season, so uh, as a time series, we also see a couple of interesting features. The first one that pops out is this here in the middle of the season. There's an eight game winless slump here in the middle of the season that also coincides with uh, two Coppa Italia games. So is this possibly due to physical overload to players, but something to, for the fitness group to look into? Uh, there's also a slump here at the end of the season where performances drop off. And again, something to look into for the fitness group. Is this due to physical overload? And if so, for the player evaluation group to identify backup for these the most overloaded players in these, uh, in these regions. And there's also a couple of key games in here that we can uh, have a look at. So this is Lazio at home, which was a draw. Could have well easily been a loss. And while lots of away in the final game, looks like a fairly deserved victory. But these were the key games. Um, if you look at expected goals only in isolation, uh, we can look at the expected goals against here for all opponents on the right hand side. Uh, seem to defensively we're doing quite well. We're, we're mainly predicting the opposition to low quality shots, a lot of shots from distance. Uh, there is, however, we're seeing there's uh, we're letting in less goals than expected. So we need to assess why that is. There's, are we, do we have players that are good in the box? Uh, did a keeper have a blinding season? Or is this something that is likely to regress towards the mean the next season? And if so, how can we compensate for those goals? Um, offensively, we're also doing fairly well. Um, though 
there is a lot of shots from distance there and we should really try to coach the players into taking better shot positions both in order to increase the chances of scoring uh, but also in order to avoid counterattacks, for instance uh, there's another feature if you look closely um, if you look closely at the legend there seems to be a lot of headers in this not so much in this so if you look at only headers and set pieces for we can see that this is indeed true we're, um, we're scoring 17 goals here, uh, but 15 goals from headers while letting in three goals from headers. So 15 goals from headers, that's way above the league average. And it underlies a couple of in line things. So it seems to be very reliant on, uh, on Icardi, for instance. So if he gets injured, he could be in trouble. I also need to assess why this is, why are we scoring so many goals? from set pieces and, and headers is this you know, is this corners taken quickly or something um, but again overperforming the XG so taking this into account with the defensive performance we saw here there's a potential nine game swing here to our disadvantage that we need to work on avoiding uh, if we now look at expected threats um, this is offensive we can see that we are very dependent on Perisic and can draw can Kandreva's contributions from the wings. And we clearly need backup for the wingers in case they get injured or tired. And we should also try to add some more creative outlets through the middle of the pitch. Uh, if you look at the defensive metrics, this is quite interesting. So what we're looking at here is the sum of the specific way teams attack against Inter. So it's not, this, this is how they set up specifically when they attack against Inter and not on average. And what we see here is that they're clearly targeting our left back side. Um, and this seems to be a weak point that we really need to address. So both for the fitness group and the player evaluation group, this is something to look into, find suitable left back is this something that's due to physical attributes like poor stamina, is slow, etc. So after looking at all of this, uh, we simulated four different scenarios for the upcoming season. Uh, with various assumptions on both how we and the competitors invested in the squads. For reference, we also simulated a base case representing no change in the close season for any team. And the basis for what we've done is uh, using uh, 538 soccer power index ratings. And we're also emulated their approach in the basis of our simulation. So the first, uh, there's three metric here. This is the power rating. This is an indication of how strong the team is. Then you have the offensive and defensive metrics, which is you can view as expected average expected goals for and against throughout the season. Then these are adjusted and weighed by the power index of the club that you're, you're playing against. Um, for three of the scenarios, we only adjusted uh, the power index based on the assumptions of how much money each club spent during the close season. Uh, and in one scenario, we also changed the offensive and defensive metrics for Inter specifically based on an evaluation of uh, players we targeted in, uh, in the scouting. So this, when we did this, we looked at some specific players. So we looked at their performance for their course for the clubs in 1718, looked at the corresponding players in Inter and made an assessment on how they would contribute to better defensive metrics and better offensive metrics. And use that as well in the simulation. Now, for instance, we looked at Felipe Luis uh, as a potential replacement for, uh, for the Ambrosia at left back. There's also some younger players that we looked at. So we looked at you know, both Polish and, and younger players here. But based on this, we made six different scenarios that we can look at there, but there are four, four scenarios that we simulated for the upcoming season. We're not going to look at all of these. The two most interesting scenarios turn out to be scenario C and scenario D. Uh, in scenario C, we assume that Inter outspend the competition, but without a clear plan. You know, like, oh, this is a good player, let's buy him, while you know, not really taking into account how he would this player would fit into Inter and if it really address one of the key problems Inter has. 
uh, while scenario D is that targeted player scenario that we discussed uh, previously, where we're recruiting players specifically to help shore up the left back and to contribute more offensively. And what we see here is that if you just spend the money without a clear plan, it really doesn't help you much. So from the base case and outspending the competition, we're really not any closer to being certain that we're uh, ensuring Champions League qualification for the upcoming season. But when we do the targeted approach and really fix the gaps that we had identified in earlier, you see that the chance of Champions League success increased by 50%. It goes up from 54 to 76% chance of uh, for qualification, which is nice. And what we did finally was that we looked at the total cost for the players that we identified. So we identified eight players here. The total cost for these players was estimated to be around 44 million euros from Transfermarkt at the time, um, which corresponds to about the low estimate for Champions League prize money, um, assuming that you're, you're not get a, getting out of the group stage. So what we did in addition was that we made a quick return on investment analysis on this. And it turns out if you invest in these players, uh, we see an increase in available cash by approximately 170% if you're using this approach. So all in all, this seems like a sensible way to spend the money. Um, and that is really all we had from this. So I'll um, so thank you. And um, I guess there's a round of questions before I hand over to Christian. Fantastic. If you could, um, well, you may want to go back to the screen share afterwards, but I'm thinking if you could just put the, um, I'll put the view on like that. Um, yeah, so please do ask questions in the chat. There's already a load of questions coming in. I want to, uh, I want to say, first of all, one thing I really appreciate about the talk, and I think this thing to do with the defending in the left back, that was the thing that struck me the most, using expected threat in order to, um, to find out where you were weakest was very convincing. And I liked it where, where the other teams attacked specifically against you. I thought that was very good. Um, and I have, I have one question I'd be interested in. Uh, when you did the... When you did the the 538 model, did you download transfer marked data and recreate their entire model? Um, we we did use their, uh, the the ratings from the end mm. of the season, um, but we didn't recreate their model. We used a similar ish model because they don't really the entire methodology is somewhat black box they, they, they tell mm -hmm. you how they do it but not exactly how they do it so we, we did use uh, an approach where you know, we assumed that uh, the competition we assumed the top six outspend the rest of the league uh, and we looked at the average spend above you know the spend above average throughout the um, in the leagues is also based a bit on historical mm -hmm. data uh, to, you know, to see what was likely to be spent and then adjust to the power ratings based on that. Um, I don't, well, my specific question was, did you download trans, did you download transfer data or how did you know how much, how much your squad was worth and how much other people's squads were worth? Um, it's a shame Chagler and Mignon is not, but it doesn't really okay. their work. Uh, so that's the detail are, is in what they did there. I was more looking at the visuals and uh, the expected threat. So particularly that, how I do have it in the report. <laughs> in the yeah, I'll, I'll have to share the report, uh, as, um, the report as well, actually, um, when we do this. And I'll, I'll do that on Twitter later. OK, I'm going to go through these questions. There's lots of them. Um, Himanshu wants to know, um, does expected threat include throw-ins? Um, it could. We specifically excluded uh, all set pieces and only looked at open play and expected threats. You, know, you can use whatever you want in there, but it's uh, it's a ball progression mm. thing, or progression thing. It looks at states going from one part of the pitch to another and how did that increase the chance of uh, 
But those points on the line of the pitch, for example, if you, you know, where you had a very blue hot point for your very good attack, did that include yeah. throw ins in that or, or was that just? No. So all the expected threats uh, that we looked at was specifically open play on. Okay. So that was, yeah, it's a uh, crosses from open play from Kandreva, most likely that hot blue pitch. Okay. Uh, then Mayela Riena wants to know um, what you used for the visualization. Uh, <laughs> that's my own plots from, uh, so it's my plot with my own personal tweaks. Okay. Yeah, because I think that was another very striking thing. I mean, there, and we're going to see this also in the player thing that the whole group had a nice inter themed presentation with very good visualizations. Um, and then there's a whole debate about um, if they if Inter played with three centre backs at all. Season. Um, and then I think somebody else, uh, Stefan, has been in and said it was the, there was four defenders, but maybe um, did they play with four defenders the whole season? It's not really that straightforward to see from the Y Scout data. Okay. But uh, as far as we could tell, they predominantly play with four, four defenders at two central backs in this season, as far as I can remember. Uh, yeah. and, well, there really is lots of questions. So a series of questions from Vinay. Um, he wants to know, can player exits also be accounted for in the scenarios that you ran there at the end? Um, you no, know, of course you could. Um, I don't remember from the top of my head if they had a lot of exits in the close season on important, but well, well, they did have, and we did take it into account actually. But some of the worries we saw was that uh, in the second half of the season where they picked up, they had a couple of very important loan players like uh, Rafinha and uh, Howell Cancelo, who both had important contributions offensively, which needed to be replaced. So we did look a bit at that as well, uh, especially when we targeted the players to that we needed. So we were specifically looking for players that uh, replaced their outputs. And um, a question about the graph where you merge um, A and XT, the, is it meant to be expected gin and tonic? I like this name a lot, the expected G and T. Um, how, how, do you do, how do you do that? Uh, how we merge them? Yes. Specifically? Yes. Um, it's it's uh, there is a formula in there which uh, I yeah. I think the specific question is how what determines alpha and beta. So so I think they've understood there's a yeah. formula involving an so, alpha and beta, but what what determines it? Yeah, it, it's uh, it's basically shot ratio and, uh, and 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 possession ratios. So uh, it's. If, you had, if there is a lot of shots in the game, then we're weighing XG more than XT. Mm. If there's few shots, but a lot of possession, then XT is more dominating in the, in the model. That's, you know, it's a, if you just average them, it doesn't really answer. The, the point that we tried to use, the, the, the idea that we had was to use XT in those games, where, there are a lot of games where it dominates a lot on the pitch, but for some reason you, you, you're just not getting shots off it. The block, the final pass is just exactly wrong or stuff like that. But where you, you were in a lot of very good chances to get a shot off or to put up a good chance, but it just didn't happen. Hmm. It just didn't be able to connect on the cross or something like that. So. In those games, we felt that XT was more representative. Of course, if you're getting a lot shot, a lot of shots off, then XT is more representative. Um, Kaglar has now clarified for me in the chat everything about how you downloaded the club values from TransferMark. So now, I've, now I know that you did you did download all of them. So that's really interesting. Then there's a whole debate about that. Uh, Will Fenwick, I'll ask one last question. He says it's uh, great stuff. What he wants to know is how did you assess how much your prospective signings would improve the team and what evidence do you have for this? So what we did then was for the defensive part, uh, we looked at the specific zones that the players occupied and looked at the expected threats they prevented. So or you know, we looked at the failed XT in their zone, which we then used as a proxy for you know, defensive strengths. If you 
if there's a lot of XT that didn't happen, that failed in your uh, in the section of the pitch that you're occupying, that's likely to be because of you and not because of the opponent just missing anything. So we looked at the zones there and then we assessed the contributions that the players had to their total XT uh, to, on a club level versus uh, the corresponding player in Inter. So if, let's say, um, Felipe Luis, if you look at him and you said, okay, he, he his contribution to the XT prevented in Atletico Madrid on his, in his position was X percent. Then we looked at the corresponding thing for, uh, for D'Ambrosio in, in Inter. So how, you know, how much XT did he help prevent from his zone? Then we adjusted the, the defensive numbers based on those percentages. For, um, Great. for the XT. Um, fantastic. Um, good, right. Well, I'd love to continue discussing this, but I think we should move on to the players. And uh, Christian, you're going to present the um, the player part of the talk. Yes. And I'll hand over directly to you. You should be able to share your screen now and, uh, and talk there. Uh, hang on. I think I just need to change my screens around. Uh, hang on. So you can see that screen. If I do this, so it displays. Cool. Can you now see my slides? Yes, great. Um, so yes, I'm Christian. So I'm I'm representing the the group that looked at player performance. Uh, and so I'm speaking on behalf of Ashish uh, and Giacomo, Oli and Victor. So taking uh, what uh, Ledver has just sort of spoke about, so he's really highlighted the overall strengths and weaknesses of Inter Milan, whereas the objective of what the play performance group was, was wanting to do was take a, a data-driven approach to a few things. Firstly, to identify high and poor performing players within the Inter Milan squad. And secondly, to identify transfer targets across all positions, across different leagues that would enable Inter Milan to mitigate against potential key asset losses. Um, so if Barcelona, Real Madrid, Bayern Munich came in for one of our key stars, could we replace that player like for like? Um, secondly, quite obviously, we want to be able to strengthen positions of vulnerability. We want to improve the team. And third, as Lode said, uh, we have just qualified for the Champions League for the first time in six years. We'll be having more games to play. So we need to be able to add some strength in depth. And just to provide some orientation, so some key actions over the last year. In the last transfer window, we fended off a 45 million euro bid uh, from Manchester United for Perisic, one of our best players. Uh, and secondly, we added some strength to the defence. We added uh, Skriniar at centre half for 34 million euros, and we added Dalbert at left back for a little bit over 20. Uh, and also on the, the Cancelo signing, uh, we took him on loan, uh, but as of right now, we have not selected the option to, to buy. Now, I think a really interesting thing in data-driven recruitment is just how competitive it is off the pitch. Uh, so a really interesting stat is that since 2014, Barcelona have spent nearly half a billion euros on, on their recruitment, and yet Liverpool have spent a third of that and have gone on to win the Champions League. Now, that's an interesting thing because Barcelona have one of the best football data science teams in the planet, which goes to show just how hard it is. And it's hard because football, in essence, is a really complex uh, invasion game with game-changing actions happening off the ball. And it's also really difficult to tease out the contribution of the individual and how that actually impacts on the team's performance. Um, but it is possible, uh, and we have Will Spearman there uh, showing everybody how to, to go and do it. Um, and, and he's, you know, I, I think, a very impressive character in, in this space. So. The practical approach that, that we took with this was to combine inter KPIs that suit our style of play and weave in this more systematic framework with which to, to value player actions. So exactly like Lode said, uh, it was sort of an entire team approach with which to, to use expected threats. And I'll probably talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, but the reason for the selection was because it's a really intuitive way of valuing on the ball actions that move the game 
into a state of increased gold likelihood. And I stress the state aspect there because underneath the hood, it's a Markov chain model. Uh, and just a couple of reasons why, and especially on the, the thread of us trying to isolate specific players and their contributions, uh, we want to be able to reward individual player actions that aren't just goals and assists, but we also want those, those actions uh, to be independent of the outcome of the possession. So if your star deep lying playmaker has just played an, an unbelievable killer pass to a striker, but they fluff their chance, so see, they, they deserve some points for that. Um, and, and that's what an XT enables. And just to give you guys a very rough uh, sort of methodology of how it works, you will chop up your pitch into zones uh, and assign XT values to those zones that reflect threat. That threats in units of goals of either shooting or moving from that position. And the way in which you value moving actions is that you compute the difference between the XT between the start zone and the end zone. So moving from Lode's talk where he's really highlighted a key strength and a key weakness, he highlighted that Inter Milan focus threat through the wings, creating chances through crosses and show that we have quite strong proficiency when it comes to headers. Um, he also showed that opponents actually deviate from their usual strategy to actually target our left back. And so I'll, I'll dig into that in a little bit more detail. So starting with the strengths. Uh, and so Inter Milan possess uh, real world-class dribbling and crossing. And so we looked at, at these sort of metrics across a few different axes. Uh, we produced these rather uh, lovely uh, radars that Giacomo came up with. And actually, as a fun aside, this was the computationally most intensive part of the entire uh, sort of analytic uh, part of the course nine minutes per radar. Um, so we came up with a few different metrics. Uh, we came up with three different XT-based metrics, that of dribbling, crossing, and passing. Uh, we also came up with a rather nice ELO-based metric. Uh, and so this is almost like a chess match uh, of attack versus defense. And actually, uh, this will probably be uh, quite topical if everybody's just binged the Queen's Gambit. Um, it's a really interesting thing to try and uh, look at sort of uh, you, know, you, versus, you versus me uh, scoring. Uh, and then we also added in some XG to the mix. We looked at XG added both in terms of shots and headers. Then we rounded out the radar with a little bit more of a traditional metric uh, that in terms of the number of touches in the opponent's area. Uh, and the really interesting thing when it comes to looking at Perisic, our left winger, and Kondreva, our right winger, is that they really are in the top percentiles in the world when it comes to crossing and dribbling. And a nice thing that, that we get from this uh, sort of two-factor approach of looking at dribbling via both XT and ELO, is that XT shows us that Kondreva and Perisic have sort of the tactical nous of moving into more threatening positions via the dribble. And ELO shows that they have the ability to beat another player to get there. Now, as I, I highlighted right at the start of the talk, it's pretty key that we can identify systematically replacement players should Manchester United come back in uh, for Perisic. And also, given more games for, for the team to play, can we add some strength and depth? So uh, we, we have systematically found uh, Manchester United's Alexis Sanchez as a potential like-for-like -like replacement for Perisic, and also seen uh, there to be Victor Moses, squad rotation player at Chelsea, potential backup for Kondreva. Uh, the radar shows that both of those players are sort of excellent uh, dribblers and crossers. Uh, but an, a nice thing from sort of overlaying Perisic into the mix here is that should Manchester United come back in for Perisic, uh, our sort of management recommendation to the Inter Milan board would be if you can get a squad, uh, if you can get a player um, swap between Perisic and Alexis Sanchez, that could be a really great strategy. If essentially we can, we can turn the goals on for Alexis Sanchez, he is, he is providing sort of better passing threat than Perisic, we might end up with a better player. Uh, and it's sort of interesting to note that he operates a little bit deeper. So that's just another consideration for the coaching staff to think about. Um, so that's where we're strong. Uh, and, and Lowe's also sort of highlighted where we're a little bit weaker. So I thought I'd talk a little bit more about this, this Delta XT strategy and, and how you can calculate it because people might actually want to try this themselves. Uh, so Lowe's reminded me of, uh, of a pretty cool, um, quote from Maldini, and it's that if I have to make a tackle, I've already made a mistake. I think Rio Ferdinand also kind of has the same ethos. And really, it's a challenge given the data that we have to calculate these kinds of things. We are dealing with uh, on-the-ball events data, which is blind to off-the-ball context. 
which means that it's, it's blind to the art of defending without having to make tackle. So we're going to have to observe this indirectly. And so the, the strategy that, that Loeb sort of showed in his slides is that to you calculate the average opponent threat per zone, excluding Inter Milan. Uh, so for an opponent versus all of their other 18 uh, sort of opponents within the league. Then you do the same thing, but just look at the games versus Inter Milan, then essentially take one from Tudor and sum them. And it's really cool because on the right, you can see what this looks like for Inter Milan, as well as a couple of other clubs that also have weakness at left back, uh, Borussia Dortmund and Real Madrid. But what's really interesting from Inter's point of view is that sort of halfway through the season, they ditched all three of their first team left backs. They ditched Nagatomo, Dalbert and Santon. And they replaced them with a right footed right back, Dan Brasinio, at, at left back. And it's really cool to see just how wide Inter's opponents are attacking that left back threat. They're going wider than they are with Borussia Dortmund and with Real Madrid. They're really attacking that weak left side of, of Dan Rossini. Um, so that's, that's where sort of Inter are a little bit weak. Actually, they have a very cool strength. And so one of the questions that Lode was asked was, what, is the, what was the uh, formation of that back four? So it was back four uh, and two classic centre halves. And what we found from our analysis is that Miranda and Skriniar, the two centre halves, they complemented each other fantastically well. Um, both of them were world-class one-on-one defenders against the dribble. They were both sort of in the 92nd and 99th percentile dealing with Adam. And that metric was calculated from the flip side calculation from the winger ELO metric that I mentioned earlier. And also you can see just how they complement each other's weaknesses. You can see that visually just by how that radar uh, that Giacomo has been able to produce is almost is, is sort of filling up with different colors from different players. Uh, and it's quite cool to see that Skriniar, he takes chances to intercept the ball, uh, knowing that he can recover if that pressure fails by making that slide tackle in the defensive dribble. Now, his, he's a younger player and he's complemented by Miranda, a more experienced head. Uh, Miranda sort of is, a, is defensively really dominant. You can see that he's in some of the higher percentiles of defensive aerial duels won. Uh, and you can also see that he is the master of defensive pressure. So that's a really cool metric that we were able to tease out of the Y scout data. And it came out of the Jules taxonomy where somebody wasn't actually dribbling is when it was attacker versus defender, essentially without actually having to make a dribble. It was when it was just physical pressure. So we use the same ELO metric and same ELO algorithm to do that, to almost come up with a, an off the ball pressure score. And it goes to show that um, Miranda would favor to apply pressure and to make clearances rather than to try and take a higher risk uh, strategy of, of diving in and making an interception. Uh, and then on the, the, the other side of the ball, when trying to, to go offensively, it's quite cool to see that Skriniar uh, also provides that offensive threat. So he can build attacks from the back. You see that he is sort of above average when it comes to his XT from passes. And it's also quite nice to see these aerially dominant in the opponent's box as well. He was Inter Milan's third highest scorer that year. Uh, and you probably would see some of his goals in some of Lode's plots from earlier. Uh, and it was quite interesting to hear from journalists that this was, um, this was called an artist tank partnership. And it was reminiscent of sort of the, the, the better days under Mourinho where Inter Milan won the Champions League, it won the treble, uh, where sort of the, the artist tank partnership at that time was Walter, Walter Samuel and Lucio. Um, but one thing that wasn't quite so reminiscent of, of those glory years is at fullback. So here we're showing Nagatomo, the player that played most uh, at left back for the club. Uh, and we're comparing him here against Miranda, looking at various defensive statistics. And we see that actually he's either average or below average uh, for most of those metrics. So he's certainly no Zanetti. Um, and just to now think about how this sort of weaves into the other group's work. Uh, so the link to the fitness group is that, as I've kind of mentioned with the defensive side, on the ball events really only provide half the story. Um, what the, the fitness data that, that Miguel can talk through is that it provides you that direct off the ball context. Um, it also can link these technical attributes that we've looked at in these radars to some more physical metrics. They're playing, they're going to be playing more Champions League games. It'll require more energy to do so. Uh, and also 
there's an interesting feature with all of these data sets in that the events data that we looked at was the 1718 season. The fitness data that we looked at was two years later. So uh, maybe there's a, sort of a two years later, are we happy with our left backs there? Um, and the next steps with, with this kind of analysis that we were doing is, you know, can we look for uh, left and right back first team replacement candidates? Uh, and as you've seen, we've really focused on wingers. We focused on sort of various elements of the defense. Uh, can we expand these range of metrics to cover a broader range of decisions, uh, positions? Uh, and that's, that's me done. Um, thank you. Any questions? Uh, David, I think you're on mute. I could try a blip read. <laughs> Classic muted. Um, brilliant presentation. Uh, first thing I want to do is put Giacomo on the spot and ask him to tell us a little bit more about these um, beautiful player radars, because I think you were just, you were doing this to spike me somehow. I made some sort of condescending remarks in the, during the presentation, during the thing about the shape of radars, and you made a radar which has perfect, um, the area under it reflect, is proportional to the skill of the player. Uh, maybe you could say a little yeah. bit about that because I think it's yeah. also said it's much faster now. I see in the chat. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, it was. Um, I had it. It was. It was badly organized. My code, so it was solving the same equations for every time, plus also for the background. So yeah, but it 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 it, it, it runs in about ten seconds now. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't think I have anything to share on the screen. Maybe Christian can put up one of these. But anyway, the, the idea is that... Um, if you could put one up, Christian, while he talks about it, that would be good. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so the, the idea is that between two values, um, uh, you, you create a function, which is, which is a curve. And, and exactly what function doesn't really matter how. But the important thing is that you can have this, um, this function curve up or curve down, uh, like, so, so dipping or rising like a hill. And then you plot this in polar coordinates between these. And um, an important feature is a central counter. So the shapes get a bit weird if you if you run zero from the very center of the chart. So you need this uh, central counter to be of a, of a certain size. Um, and then essentially you you work out the polar integral of this curve between between the two connected points and solve it so it's proportional to the average of the two adjacent values. So for example, on this uh, center back chart, you've got um, for Miranda, uh, XT from passes is 53 and um, ELO defensive dribble is 92. Mm -hmm. So that little bit of blue curve joining those two things will be proportional to um, halfway between 53 and 92, and then it's the same for each thing. So each each value kind of has its area shared um, uh, between the two adjacent segments. Yeah, and the other thing That's I really cool. love about it is it's is, is very is unique combinations of metrics as well. Um, they're very different from the metrics you typically see on, on this. In fact, every one of them seems Sort of unique metric that I haven't seen before and they're also organized in a nice way that they do make sense with the one next to the other that you've got um, defense that you've got defensive pressure next to clearances so you've got the defensive down on the bottom left and then the attacking on the right so I, I, I am a big admirer of these uh, these diagrams I like them a lot um, let me have a look here if there's what there are other questions with well, there's one question which said um, Maybe Barcelona's um, uh, data science team don't have much input on their transfer strategy. Do you have any comment on that, Christian? Because you were saying something it's there really at the start. Cool. Of that. And that actually might be true. Um, so, I, I mean, obviously, they're quite a, um, a political uh, board, uh, as, as we've sort of seen recently. Uh, and also, it, from, from looking at the research that that group does, it, it might well be that the, the focus and the remit of that data science team is actually not on recruitment, but actually it's more on the... Um, for the team that they have, how can they sort of improve the strategy of that team? Uh, that's certainly what I've seen from, from the research of that group. So, I mean, maybe one, one message is they're doing amazing things when it comes to sort of how the team should perform given those players. Maybe they should be provided with a wider remit, um, one that can, can maybe speak more towards recruitment. Cool. 
Um, and a question about Sanchez being right-footed. I'm not actually, um, Him Himanshu would, would like you to comment on that. Um, is that taken into consideration? I'm not actually sure of the context of that. You might know better than me. Uh, I, there, there were some various metrics when we were looking at um, sort of the, the primary fit of the, of the player that we looked at, but it didn't feed into to these, um, the way in which we performed the systematic search. So the way in which we provided the, performed the systematic search was, so we have identified subjectively which metrics we think um, are, are appropriate for that position, i.e. the things that are on the spokes here. And then because we can provide a normalized ranking of those various metrics, i.e. to be able to put them into percentiles, the way in which we produced um, the, the systematically found players was essentially just to be looking at things where those players were in the 95th plus percentile in the areas that we were really interested in. Um, mm. To be honest with you, I, I think that, that the foot of which Sanchez was playing was probably the least of his worries at that point. As a Manchester United fan, mm -hmm. I was tearing my hair out as he just gunned at the barn door. Um, so mm -hmm. it, it, it would be an interesting thing if, if um, there was some reversion to the mean ride of, of how badly he was performing in front of goal um, in that particular season and if he could bounce back for next season. Uh, great. Will has a question about the ELO ratings. He thinks is a great idea. And he asked if you've uh, tried to apply them to other player actions and also if there's particular players that have stood out on those ELO ratings. Yeah. So the interesting thing that we did with the with the ELO ratings is that normally uh, in, in a chess match, you have the same objective. Both players are essentially trying to win uh, and, and to do it in the same way. With um, these particular sort of ELO ratings that we put together, the, the attacker actually has a different objective to the defender. The attacker has the objective of beating their man, whilst the defender has the objective of defending that player. And so actually, rather than just producing a single ELO score for every single sort of interaction, actually for every single um, type of dribble, we would provide two. There would be an attacking ELO score and a defensive ELO score. Uh, and so there's essentially just a modification to that code and it's all on GitHub, so more than happy to share that. Um, so that's sort of how we produced those, those scores. And we used the, the Y Scout taxonomy to really find interesting um, sort of player versus player interactions. And the, the key sort of part of the setup right. was how do you actually map them together? So given that sort of this kind of data set is just giving you a blow by blow by blow of what a single player does, you essentially have to be able to map attacker versus, versus the defender. So all that we could really pull out from, from that was was in the dribble in this dual taxonomy. We, we didn't apply it to anything else. Um, great, so uh, there's a question here about how these models compare with upcoming young players. It's Specifically really... a question about how likely, what, how likely was Bastoni to make it into the inter team based on his performances that season? Has you, have you any comment on that? Um, or in no particular comment. on the young players? Yeah, no comment on on um, sort of very very sort of specific players like that. But one of the really hard um, parts of this entire area um, of trying to sort of unearth new talent is to some way of being able to normalize across leagues. So quite a lot of the sort of the academic research coming out now, it will sort of have a top ten ranking for for this particular sort of feature or something of like that, and it will often sort of have. Uh, you know, promising young players, but in the Portuguese league or something like that, there's often no cross-league normalization when it comes to, to looking at some of these scores. Uh, and so that was actually, the, the, the ELO method was almost a bridge there because actually you can, because it's sort of um, player versus player interactions, you can perform those both interleague and cross-league. So you can look at cup games in both domestic competition uh, uh, as well as sort of cup games uh, in Europe. And that would actually have some nice way of normalizing across leagues. And that's the kind of thing that, that I think in with future work would be able to start to point out at ah, this Portuguese player looks really promising. And that's after we've normalized for the fact that it's easier to dribble past someone in, in Portugal. Great. Last question then. Rodrigo would like to know if um, he said that you've compared into Milan to Dortmund and Real Madrid. Um, how deep have you analysed other teams um, only on the left side comparison or have you done anything more than that? 
just those teams because they were the teams of the other groups uh, in, in the course. So I kind of wanted to show them up that I knew their weaknesses before they did. Um, <laughs> oh, that's very nice. I, did, <laughs> I didn't read that, actually. I didn't think about that, but that's very nice. A <laughs> uh, bit uh, of competitive niggling there. <laughs> but it, it would be very straightforward. Um, so the the um, algorithm can, can be applied for, for any team to, to, to look for those kinds of things. And actually, it, when I did run it on a few other teams, it showed it showed, say, Manchester United to be really weak, not on their wings, but actually weak centrally. And that, and it was this data that was um, the season just before they bought Maguire. And actually, Maguire was seen as a, an amazing de defender that season, both in terms of the defence against the dribble and against the pressure. So um, the narrative would have fit, given the data that we'd have seen, that Maguire was an exceptional purchase for Manchester United at that point to strengthen the middle of that defence. Hmm. Great, thank you very much. I think we're going to go over to Miguel now to do the last part of the um, last part of the presentation. I'll say two things before Miguel hops in. Um, first, are you going to switch your screen off there, Christian? Ah, yes. Um, uh, two things. I think first of all, he had the tough task of the fitness group had the tough task that they were using a different season's data. Miguel kept asking me if I could find uh, the actual data for the proper season, but we couldn't quite get that together. Um, so it's a sort of little bit of a different story here. And also, I, th I think it's nice to introduce Miguel because he kind of, when we were doing these projects, he held together the group in a very impressive way and organized every meeting, which made it a lot easier for me when we had the meetings because he had like right now, now Ludwig is going to tell you this, this thing, Giacomo has got this thing to say to you. And it was really structured meetings. And I think that was a, a very nice quality as well. So it's with great pleasure that I'm going to hand over to Miguel and he's going to tell you about the uh, player fitness review from the 1920 season for Inter. Brilliant, brilliant. So David, appreciate the, the introduction. In truth, now I have to say, well, first of all, you know, the group was already very much motivated and it's, it's brilliant when you have a motivated group to be able to kind of bring them together and everything like that. So that, that there never really is any, any bother at all when, when, when that happens. Um, I am going to take a few minutes, obviously, to talk about the player fitness group. And again, uh, there was a, a three great guys working with me, uh, Demetrius, who's here as well on screen, Stefan was here, and also Kareem is here on screen as well. So Again, the group, we're really looking at uh, player fitness, and we should also identify that it was uh, the year uh, 1920. It was the 2019-2020 season that we had to look at because we were lucky enough that uh, Skills Corner had opened some of their data. Now, uh, they had specifically opened data for the top two teams that played in the Italian League in 1920, which was Inter Milan and uh, Juventus, and then the top two for the UK League or the English Premiership, for the Bundesliga and for Spain and for France. Obviously, we looked at Inter Milan and what we wanted to take from the skill corner data was uh, perf fitness performance metrics, which we try to call fitness features. So a set of features that, that, that we would try and identify from this data. And we actually identified about 12 of them, which I'll show you that in a second. But on top of that, then we wanted to relate those fitness features to a set of match actions. And particularly to, to kind of think about time when it's a good time to substitute a player, for example. Could we identify this in, in the data in some way, shape or form? But then we also identified that we, we wanted to link to the player performance assessments, as you've just heard from Christian. And uh, to see, again, uh, given some of the, the questions and, and the items that Christian was identifying, could we identify, again, fitness feature items that would help with that uh, looking at identifying those players we might want to bring into the club? And from overall perspective, from the club performance, uh, Ludwig has spoken about, you know, Inter Milan had qualified for the Champions League, which immediately would say that there's a new energy workload to, to come into the team. So we wanted to show, well, from the data that we had to hand, what, what would it mean from the energy workload that they had just uh, expensed and what would it mean for, for the new season? And, and to ground us in all of this, uh, in, in this whole area, Part of the program was to look specifically at the acceleration deceleration profile of the player. That was one of the asks as part of this program. And that is, you know, uh, the, the, the ratio between when a player accelerates compared to when he decelerates. And it might be an indication of, of not just their fitness, but how active they are within the match. And what we want to do is be able to cluster players based on a modeled profile that we were coming up with between 
between us within this within this particular team and also to um, combine additional fit fitness features to uh, basically have a base profile that we could work from. Now something I should say here before I move on as well we were delighted to get our hands on the tracking data that came from Skills Corner but when we started to do our first analysis of it, we did identify obviously that, that there were some missing bits. There were frames where people weren't available. Again, just to say the data was taken from broadcast TV and then we would get X, Y coordinates and the tracking of where data players were. But there were frames where players were missing. Uh, goalkeepers were missing a good bit of the time. Uh, there were certain times when midfield players were, were, were missing. And so we, we, we did try to, to smooth out the data we did try to put in even some of our own predictions around the data, but one of the best sources of information is, believe it or not, Syria from the official website does a full detailed report on every match. And when you go to the Juventus inter matches, what you find is they have a 16, 17 page PDF describing a whole load of things about the match. And usually on page five or six, you find the fitness performance data. So. We use this as a basis to see, well, what data were we extracting from the tracking data that we had to hand to what we were seeing from other sources and try to extrapolate from that uh, things like distance per minute played. But anyway, that's the grounding on the data. Just to give you an overview of the 12 fitness features. So we huddled together at the very start of this project. And also, I must say that the presentation made by SUDS and, and the Benfica presentation that was made earlier in, in this pro in the, the fitness tracking program really helped us identify a number of these first ones, things like distance covered, uh, number of sprints, the frequency of sprints, the speed bands, the walking, jogging, running. Um, so that was a great help from SODS, but we did come up with a couple ourselves as well, the distance per minute played, um, and also look at the energy profile, uh, particularly looking at joules and calories. And this is something we'll show in a little bit. Uh, and you'll see at the end then this, this, this idea of just tracking velocity as people went in. I mean. Uh, Kareem did a very interesting thing with the Vertleg yeah, algorithm to try and identify that. Uh, that was a helping hand. Just to show you one slide specifically on one of those 12 fitness features, and this is the frequency of sprints. And what we're going to see here are two diagrams. So there's two matches. First match is in October. Uh, Inter Milan are at home. And what you're seeing here is essentially a sprint if we saw a player over about uh, five frames, if they were going over seven meters per second, we identify that as, as a sprint. Uh, and you can see Palantano here is uh, quite high for Inter Milan. And you can see a number of players for Juventus were also quite high in this metric. Although what we did identify was substitutes uh, within this metric did actually score high. We did, we did identify when substitutes came on, um, we, we could spot, spot them high across the games. Uh, here's the second game. This is Juventus playing at home to Inter Milan. One thing to note with this one now, and this still has to be verified in fairness, uh, but this was a match played behind closed doors and the frequency of sprints are actually lower. And um, we did wonder, uh, you know, was it the impact of no crowd actually in, uh, as an audience to this particular match, uh, a, a, a particular hit when it came to the frequency of sprints in some way, shape or form? You know, we still have to prove that in full, but you can see that there. So first of all, then we identified 12 fitness features and even from those, we can, you know, make some, 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 some predictions or some, make some recommendations. Uh, one was the run, average running speed over the 90 minutes. It, it looks like Inter Milan are quite strong in this. And in comparison to, to Juventus, they, they were quite comparable. And given Juventus won the league, then I think this is a fair, fair statement to make. Uh, but there were a number of areas that we identified where there was weaknesses. This distance coverage per minute, and I'll show some detail on that with Ashley Young in a few minutes, but uh, th that, that was quite low across a number of the players. The acceleration ratio itself was also quite low when you compared it to Juventus, and even the frequency of sprints were lower. Um, so one big recommendation that we spotted, even in, from the speed bands, is we'd say, Inter Milan players, please walk less jog a little bit more and certainly sprint more. <laughs> this would be something in, in their ears straight away. And um, we did also, when we did visuals on the video as well, identify that maybe player supports on the flanks, given the, the style that they were playing. In 1920, it was that season, they did go to a three, five, a two formation. So a little bit help on the flanks, it could and should have been, uh, could have been seen. Okay. 
I'm going to turn to talk a little bit about the match performance metrics because we want to take those, those features that we now have and apply them to, to match scenarios. And you can see there's a, a group of 10 that we identified here. But we did end up actually honing in this intensity when there's a goal difference or the pacing up and down of a, of, of a team. Did, did, when, when one team was, 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 was sprinting, was another team trying, trying to follow it and with the intensity was go up. And uh, does the, the pacing relate to match events specifically? So the next uh, diagram is again, boat matches again. Uh, but in this case, what we've done is we've shown you when that Juventus have scored and particularly then looking at the number of sprints after a goal of sport. So you can see here that uh, Juventus have scored and uh, again, the number of sprints after that goal has increased. Uh, again, here's Inter Milan has scored and you can see the number of sprints have increased. Uh, at the end here, Juventus have scored. Again, given that it's the last few minutes, you can see the number of sprints it, it, it have increased. So again, the, the intensity is after goals has happened. Um, that was also the case. Um, again, you can see here the uh, Juventus have scored. Again, Juventus have gone up. Or sorry, Inter Milan have gone up. They've left in a goal, so they increase. And I think this was the only case. This last goal is where we spot that uh, Juve did actually increase uh, you know, on the number of factor, but th there were other ones that they did do. Okay, that's match performance. Now, I'm going to now talk about one of the cores that we were asked to do through this project though. That was a model of acceleration, deceleration profiles, but adding a number of features. But I'm going to have a little bit of an interlooper here because Demetrius was one of the key guys to look at the way we clustered this. So I'm going to hand over to Demetrius just to give us a little overview of this profile item. Thanks, Miguel. So yeah, we were asked to uh, create an acceleration deceleration model. And uh, the goal was to cluster players based on these fitness features. And we decided to try to keep the model simple and explainable. So we used three features, the acceleration deceleration ratio, the distance cover per minute, and the sprint frequency. Uh, we ran a principal component analysis to allow for two-dimensional plotting of uh, each player. And uh, we ran a k-means clustering on principal on the principal component uh, values. Uh, here we can see uh, that we plotted the two first principal components for the inter Juventus match for all players that uh, participated for more than 35 minutes. The uh, colors of the points signify the cluster assigned by the k-means algorithm, while the colors of the circles show the actual positions of the players. So using only these three features, we're able to cluster the different positions quite well with uh, only a few outliers. And now Miguel will explain uh, how we use the model for evaluating potential uh, transfer targets and what other information we could uh, extract. Great, great overview, Dimitri. So again, before we go, so we've got our base model, but we also wanted to uh, have a little look at energy profiles. And um, what we had spotted, or what you can see in literature, is where um, uh, cyclists very much look at the threshold power as a, as, as a really good measure of uh, the fitness or the, the natural fitness of the, um, of the cyclist. And we wanted to see if we could apply this to uh, football players in some way, shape, or form. And so we took an example of the sprinter, 100 meters. He weights, he weighs 60 kg, and he finishes it in 10 seconds. So what we had a little look at was, uh, if, again, we did average the, the average acceleration two meters per second um, squared. And we had a little look, could we figure out what power he, he, was, uh, he was using? So here we have, you know, he's masked by acceleration to get the force in Newtons. Uh, and then we wanted to have a look at the work done, measured in joules, so that's the force by distance traveled. And finally, we're able to do the, the power element, which is the work done by the time taken. So we use this as um, a, a, a kind of a sample or a way of being able to, to look at the, the, the power or the power to weight ratio, because this is really what we want to show, the strength of the players for Inter Milan in particular, and in the engine room. Because in your engine room, when you have your, your three players, this is going to be the driving force behind your team as you're playing each one of your matches. And what you can see from these particular plots, again, from the first match, uh, you can see this is a distance covered on the bottom. This is the power to weight ratio. This is how much power in watts uh, divided by the, the player's weight. And you can see that uh, Brozovic in particular is what, what we would say a, a player with very natural fitness. 
and somebody that will sustain strength uh, over your matches. Uh, and he, he pops out again uh, in the, the other match as well, in the second match uh, where they played. Again, Brozovic. Again, in, in general terms as well, you see the Inter Milan players are, are, are clustered here. The full midfield, you would say, is, uh, has good strength and good stamina for, for the matches. And um, what we were also able to tell was that um, this is a model that if you apply it over a number of matches, um, it's something that you can identify when a player is starting to, um, or dare I say, become weak, but is, is starting to lose energy. Uh, and so it was something that we were also wishing to do, and you'll see this later, what we'd like to do in the future. But all of that, having given you all of this, these base elements, what we want to do is then link it to the club performance. And uh, as we said, uh, Ireland had qualified for the Champions League. And what would it mean that if they ended up playing 54 matches, then what's the potential increase load? And also, we, we have to look at strength net uh, for the squad. And where would we look to be able to uh, either add players or even replace players? And you can hear from some of the earlier presentations, the left-hand side of Inter Milan was certainly an area that we, we wanted to look at. And the two players for Inter Milan that popped out during the matches, the two matches that we had spotted was Azamoa played on the left-hand side in one of the matches and Ashley Young on the other. And what we did is we took our fitness features and we had a comparison of Ashley Young, who played on the left, and we had a little look at them against the players that played on the right-hand side of Juventus, just to get, again, the total distance, but also the distance per minute, uh, the, the meters covered per minute, the number of sprints, the frequency of those sprints, and also the, the speed bands for them. And uh, unfortunately, you can see that uh, Ashley Young, it, it doesn't compare very well against his direct opponents. He was down in a number of factors. And so the, the next thing that we tried to do was that earlier model that Demetrius mentioned. What we did is we looked at the top two clubs in the UK, looked at the top two clubs in France, Spain, and in Germany. And we took that base model and we applied it to those other matches. And we tried to cluster players to be able to identify potential targets from a fitness perspective. And I know these, these are a little bit hard to see, uh, but one thing I will say is that the players on the bottom part of this, uh, of this uh, plot, um, they're all based in the Bundesliga. They're all German players that play on the left-hand side. And as it so happens, our model seems to identify that all the players at the top, more or less, are from uh, Spain, the Spanish league. And when it comes to the center part, it's the Italian and the English uh, leagues. And uh, for example, uh, here we have Andy Robinson from Liverpool. Now, in particular, we, 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 saw, we, we, we saw from the, the, the pro, pro, pro player profiles that Andy Robinson might be a good player to identify, but we, when we had a discussion about this, we thought, well, the chances of him potentially moving uh, towards Inter Milan, maybe the cost might be prohibitive. So could we take players that were close in cluster-wise to Andy Robinson and to see if they were, from a fitness perspective, a, a good match? So um, we, we have here... Uh, Ranger, which is a player, and Juan Bernat also came out. Uh, Ranger was playing with Marseille at the time. Uh, Juan Bernat, I think, was playing with um, Bayern Munich. So we did, and with the help of Giacomo, you saw them earlier, we reused his code to take those uh, fitness features and to do a player profile and player radar, uh, comparing Ashley Young against Bernat in this place. And having it again against these fitness features, you can see where Bernard's, uh, they're very even from a fitness perspective, although the acceleration, deceleration ratio was much higher in Bernard, which is one factor we had identified earlier in this uh, presentation was an area that we, we, we wanted to, to do better. And we also got a helping hand from the, the, the player profile uh, area to, to look at uh, how Rangier would compare against uh, Rafina and how uh, Bernard would go up against D'Ambrosio. And the one thing we felt bad about was that uh, given that the uh, player event data that the club and the player teams were using was from a different year, we really felt as though we could have married up these a little bit better, but because they were from separate years, it made it a little bit difficult. And that was what David was saying earlier. Uh, but, but look, we, we did get there and we did identify a number of potential targets. Okay, there's probably loads more to say around this, but David, I think just to finish off, um, 
we, we, there's a number of fitness features that we'd love to, to, to still do. You can see there's a number that didn't tick off. Um, the energy consumed profiles, that power to weight ratio and those, those power I watts, they're very rudimentary. Uh, the rudimentary uh, algorithms that we got um, for it. So I think there's a lot more exploring to do there. And to apply clustering to, to add more features or to apply to more positions is something that we wanted to do. Uh, I've already talked about improvements around the tracking data and the event data. We didn't quite get into the recommendations of the substitutions, but we could get there. And we are finalizing the open sourcing of our code. We could put everything into uh, the GitHub SourceForge uh, our forging area, and we tracked every ticket in there. We're more than happy to, to share it with, with others within this community. Okay, David, I think that more or less covers uh, all of this particular presentation. That's, that's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks very much for that presentation and for all the presentations. I saw one question that came in in the chat, which I also had this thing about like run more. So there's this famous study that Messi does the least running and the most, he does the most walking. Um, can you say something about that? Yeah, so it, what we found though is when we did the comparison for the walking, the amount of walking that the Inter Milan were doing when you compare them to Juventus was, was, was far less. Um, so mm. that was just something that just popped out. So yes, it is fair to say that yes, walk and, and find your position, but overall they were doing it a little bit less as a team. If, and again, if you looked at the midfield position, so we kind of think, kind of, hmm, Maybe, maybe not. Maybe could be doing a little bit better there. It feels like, I mean, it feels like coaches spend a lot of their time shouting at players to run more. So I was wondering, is there some way you could use the data to present this and to motivate them to do that extra run at that right time? Yes, yes, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But do you have any specific presentation? Would you show them that the dropping off maybe after the goals and things like that? What would be the, the key thing to show them, do you think? Yeah, so the place we identify that was was in the speed bands. Um, and yeah, we, we, again, that's why we're trying to get the intensity for the, what we call the goal difference. There was another one on the intensity um, where we were showing the distance covered after a goal. Uh, that was one of the slides we didn't show. So it would be, it'd be around those ones and again, those those like we just said, when the goals were scored, just after the goals were scored, um, the, the walking that was happening at those times, um, mm -hmm. to, to, to be able to show that when the pacing up of a team, I think that's also important there, that you can see that with the, you, you know, when some games, the intensity starts to go up and you can see that there's a lot more mo movement from back to front uh, to, to, to identify when not to walk uh, during those particular times and um, potentially could give a helping hand there. Then mm. he has an interesting idea here, which I don't know if you tried, is contrasting the on the ball and the off the ball acceleration deceleration ratios. Ooh, now, no, we, so we didn't do it. And the reason I kind of hung a little bit about it as well is because um, off the ball might mean that they're off camera because, again, we were using broadcast and that was one thing that we had a little issue. And I think Lukaku in particular popped up in here as well, where he, he, he was gone missing off the, um, as in the number of frames that were missing for him uh, were quite high. Uh, and it's just the way that he, when he, he the way he drops off, uh, it doesn't stay in one position. So, so it would have been hard for him to, to do that. Um, not impossible, but uh, would have been a little bit harder to do. Um, Himan, Himanshu um, is, makes more of a comment here that um, the, the after the lockdown things, the players would be definitely lack fitness. So there would be less acceleration, deceleration there because of, um, so maybe it's just not the crowd, I think the point is there. Um, yeah, oh, yeah. we were being a bit facetious, I think, by, by saying it was a crowd thing because it would have but a lot think, more. But do you think that um, uh, with the, uh, or, or did you look to see in general any difference between the lockdown period if in some of the other matches you had access to? Uh, we, we had no. So again, yeah, that was one thing. Looking at a lot of the other divisions was not something we were able to get a good bit of time on because it, just again, around the clustering, the amount of work that was done around the clustering and the acceleration deceleration ratio just for Inter Milan alone was did, did take the time. Mm. Um, but, but obviously something that, that could be looked at. So here's a question, it's probably from Dimitri. 
Demetrius, Ben Wilcock asks, um, why did you use PCA before using K-means? Did it lead to better classification or faster execution time? Yeah, no, that, that, that's a question that, that makes sense. Uh, I was thinking the same. So th there are two reasons. First of all, we were thinking that we we're going to add uh, even more features in the, in the future. And also we wanted our code to be, to be ready for that. Uh, and another more practical reason is that it helped us to uh, plot in two dimensions uh, having all the features. But he's right that uh, the algorithm supported three dimensional data. And actually, we used all three uh, principal components for clustering the players. So it, it is a valid question, and it was mainly done uh, in order to be ready for the next features that we would like to add uh, in the future. Mm. Karim, you had a point uh, coming back to the um, difference between the before and after. Do you want to you want to say what you just said in the chat, or? Uh... Uh, yes, uh, when it comes to the uh, lockdown period, yes, it was a bit. Uh, also visible for for other teams as well because we had uh, we had Marcelia, PSG, Dortmund, Bayern Munich, uh, Dita, and others. So yes, there was uh, this trend was also available in some other games as well. Um, good, um, thanks a lot. Um, Adash asks: Fitness and player movement are more system tied things. Um, if so, how does having Robertson, who plays in a high intensity team like Liverpool, act as a base for play? players for Inter who are relatively less attacking. Okay, uh, well, maybe I misspoke because we, we didn't use him as a base. We, we actually discounted him straight away because of uh, the, the type of playing style. Um, so we, we had got some pointers from the ELO that uh, Christian was talking about earlier. Uh, that, that's how we had tried to identify uh, Bernard uh, and a couple of others. And I know I did, we, we did circle around the ELO as well as when they were close in, in that uh, general area. But I would say that we strictly use um, Robinson as a base in, in, in that assessment. There's also a point here that there is a very limited amount of data that you had in any of these things. So uh, yeah. I, do, I do admit that some of the tactical things are not going to be perfect in this sense. So. No, no, very true. <laughs> and if I, add, if I can add something, David, uh, Robertson was, was used in a bit of a tricky way. Like we know that he's a good player and that he, he could take the, the whole side. And therefore we look for players that fitness wise uh, are similar to Robertson who is actually performing well. And that's some knowledge afterwards that we used. Yeah. Yeah. It's not a bad thing to use a extremely fit player like that as a baseline or as some sort of comparison. Great. I think that, um, we're coming to a close there. Um, I think there's been brilliant questions coming the chat as well. And it's been really nice to see all you guys again after um, I got stuck straight into teaching another course after I left you. So it's been really nice to, really nice to see you and to hear your presentations. Um, I heard that you're going to put everything up or as much as you can up in various sources and so on. So please, when you do that, if you organize everything, Put, send it to me and I will put links at the bottom of the YouTube channel. And this is for anybody who's watching, watched all the way to the end. I'll put in full links of all the stuff that these guys have done. I think it's a great initiative that you do these things open source as well and share the code that you're using. It's just fantastic. And I, I don't think I'm exaggerating. I said in my tweet earlier that this is probably above the level that many data science teams will do within clubs. I mean, it really is... A fantastic level of detail that you've you've gone into now of course you are you were i don't know if it was 13 14 of you working together which is more resources than a data science team would really have but um it was just a fantastic collaboration and input and it was the same with many of well with with all the other teams who who did this this work um on that note and i think this is the final thing i want to say is that the Paris Saint-Germain team, who were extra special because they didn't do the course officially, but um, organized them all into a, a, a group on Slack, and they made um, an analysis of Paris Saint-Germain using things from the course. They've made a video, and I will put that video up um, at the weekend, actually. I'll let this video soak in a little bit, and then I'll put the PSG a video up after that. Um, but that's it for me and that's it from these guys. Just thank you really much for everything and I will switch.
YouTube um, stream. And I'll see you guys, everyone on YouTube again when we do the next um, next live thing. Bye-bye.